Hello, my name is Tommy, and in this video I'll be giving an introduction to kernel density estimation. This is going to be a graphical tutorial, I'm going to show you a lot of plots, I'm going to show you some equations, but it's not meant to be rigorous. I'll tell you at the end where you can go to find um, literature if you really want to read up on this. Let's get straight to it. Kernel density estimation is a way of estimating an unknown probability density function given some data. Now, in middle school, you probably learned about the histogram, and this is a bit like the histogram. The idea is that you define a kernel function, and you center a kernel function on each data point. So an, on every data point in your sample, you place a kernel function. After doing this, you sum these functions together. So you add the first kernel, the second one, third one, fourth and fifth, and then you have a kernel density estimate. The one over n in the equation normalizes the estimate since every kernel function must have an integral evaluating to one, and we added five, the integral will be five. Then we divide through by five to to have a, uh, an integral of one again. So that's the purpose. Now, the kernel function um, can vary. Uh, typically, you require these three things of a kernel function. It should be non-negative because uh, a probability is always non-negative. It should be symmetric meaning that if you go to the left or you go to the right of your data point, uh, the kernel should have the same value and it should be decreasing so that when you go away from the data point, uh, the kernel uh, goes closer to zero. It doesn't have to have these three properties, um, but typically in, in the simple uh, straightforward cases, this is what you demand from a kernel function. Now, a kernel function can be of bounded support or not. In this example, the Gaussian to the left does not have bounded support because it never really goes down to zero. It goes infinitely close to zero as x uh, gets infinitely larger or smaller, but it never really reaches zero. This is in contrast to the uh, box kernel, the triangular kernel, and the tri-weight kernel, which is uh, zero outside of a uh, a domain. Let's see one more example now with the triangular kernel. We add the kernel onto every single data point and then we sum these together for a density estimate. Notice that this estimate is not nearly as smooth as the Gaussian one that we saw earlier. The choice of kernel is actually not that important because uh, once you start getting data, uh, the estimates are going to look very similar no matter what kernel you choose. So it's not really crucial to, to choose uh, a perfect kernel or anything like that. Usually the Gaussian will do just fine. However, the choice of bandwidth is very important. We use a bandwidth H and we divide through, uh, through in the kernel function if h is large, then it will spread the kernel function out. We have to divide by h on the outside of uh, the kernel function again to ensure that the integral equals 1. So that's what, why you have an h outside and inside of the kernel function, uh, capital K. Now, the plot that you see here has a very small bandwidth. And if I increase the bandwidth, it looks like this. So it's not really clear what the optimal value is. Uh, clearly, the first estimate is too narrow. This might be too sp uh, spread, uh, too large. So there are a few methods to automatically choose a bandwidth. And the simple one is called Silverman's rule of thumb. Now, it computes an optimal age by assuming that the data is normally distributed. And this is somewhat paradoxical because if you really knew that the data was normally distributed, you wouldn't use kernel density estimation. You would use maximum likelihood to just estimate uh, uh, mu and sigma. But typically, your data might be close to normal. So then 
Silverman's rule of thumb is a good starting point. For instance, consider this example. We have a standard normal distribution. We generate some data and then we use Silverman's rule of thumb. This is our estimate. So it's fairly good. There's a, a different algorithm, which is better if you if you have a lot of data or if your data is multimodal, meaning there are several modes. So consider uh, this data, you have two normal distributions. They're spread apart and we generate some data from this probability density function. We get this data. If we use Silverman's rule of thumb, we end up with a poor estimate uh, where the bandwidth is too large. If you use the improved Chiodo Jones algorithm, we get a far better estimate. We do need quite a bit of data to make the improved Chiodo Jones algorithm do a good job, so that's one disadvantage. But if you suspect something that's far from normal or something that's bimodal, then this algorithm does a good job. The next thing to look at is weighing the data. In the previous example, every data point was weight, uh, weight, weighted uniformly, meaning it had the same weight. But you might have cases where uh, each data point has a weight. For instance, if these data points are the age of people, and you want to know the distribution of net worth over age, you might put age on the x-axis and weigh your data points by the net worth of each individual. And what you do is you replace the 1 over n with weights and you assign a weight to every data point and you should ensure that the sum of the weights equal 1 so that the integral of the, your estimate uh, equals 1 in the end. And apart from that it's the same thing. You add um, kernels and you weigh them so they can look a bit different and then you sum these together and this is your final estimate so pretty straightforward there's one more thing that I want to discuss in one dimension and that's bounded domains it happens quite often that you know that you're working on a bounded domain. For instance, if your data is the age of people or the net worth of individuals, then you know that uh, your density uh, is, is uh, zero when, when x is, is smaller than uh, zero. So you know that your data is supposed to be, for instance, to the right uh, side of some, some boundary. Now, if you just compute a kernel density estimate on this data, you get this. And it's a bit unfortunate because it places density to the left of the boundary. So think of this being h, and you just said that there's a probability for people being less than zero uh, of h, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. And there are many ways to deal with this, but I want to introduce a simple way to deal with it, and it's called uh, mirroring the data. What you do is you mirror the data about the boundary like so. Then you compute a kernel density estimate on this new mirrored data. Then you sum your original and mirrored um, kernel density estimate. And then you chop this so that it's zero to the left of the boundary. Now compare the blue final kernel density estimate with the red one you see that um, it's, it's moved some of the density from the left of the boundary to the right of the boundary. So this is a simple trick to ensure, um, to ensure that uh, you don't get this bias at the boundary if you have bounded domains. Let's go to D dimensions, or more specifically, let's go to two dimensions. Now, if you want to extend to higher dimensions, one way to do it is to introduce a norm because you need some measure of distance in higher dimensions and there are several to choose so you're gonna choose a p norm for instance and you're gonna replace the 1 over h with 1 over h to the power of d to normalize and apart from that it's the same thing so here you see four kernels in two dimensions 
the box kernel, the triangular kernel, the byweight kernel, and the Gaussian kernel. The choice of norm really matters in higher dimensions because you're allowed to pick a norm and it's not obvious in every case which norm is the correct one. Typically, p equals 2 in the p norm, which corresponds to a standard Euclidean distance, is a good choice because it's invariant under rotation, but there are other choices as well. The common choices are p equals 1, p equals 2, and p equals infinity. p equals 1 is often called the Manhattan distance because it's the distance that you have to travel in a grid. So imagine the city of Manhattan with uh, streets looking looking like a grid. p equals 2 is the Euclidean norm and p equals infinity is the maximum norm. Let's look at these kernel functions as we change the norm. The box kernel looks different uh, in different norms and so does the triangular kernel and the Gaussian kernel. Let's look at what happens when we have some data. Now you're going to see that as the number of data points increases, the choice of kernel and the choice of, um, of p in the p norm doesn't really matter. It's going to look more and more similar. So let's add some data. It still looks pretty different, but as we increase the data and work our way towards a thousand data points, you'll see that the estimates grow closer and closer, and in the end, it looks very much the same. So just like in one dimension, the choice of kernel is not really that important. The choice of kernel and the choice of p norm is not really that important in higher dimensions. So you don't really have to worry too much. The two norm is typically fine, but it's still an interesting point to bring up. The bandwidth is still important, and in higher dimensions, the bandwidth is not necessarily a number anymore. It could be a matrix, because you could have different bandwidths in different directions, and it doesn't really have to be aligned um, aligned with the principal axis. So you could have a, a, a matrix of bandwidths in, in the higher dimensional case, a D times D matrix in D dimensions. Let's look at a fast algorithm for actually computing a kernel density estimate. This is just, if you're interested, it's a very quick explanation and it's interesting to see. So the fast computation in one dimension uh, is performed using linear binning and then convolution. It's not the only fast algorithm, but in practice, this is really fast and it's uh, quite a simple algorithm. So I'd really like to show it to you. Imagine that you have data and you have a grid. Your grid is equidistant, meaning the distance between every two uh, grid points is, is the same. So it's, for instance, one, two, three, four, and so forth. And then you have some data, and the data is not equidistant necessarily. What you do is you go through every data point, and then you assi assign weight to the grid points that are close to every data point. So you go to the first data point, and then you assign weights to grid points one and two. This assigns slightly more weight to grid point two because the data point is slightly closer to grid point two and to grid point one. Same with the next one. And then this third data point is very close to the third grid point. So it will almost exclusively assign weight to this grid point. And then you go through the data like this, assigning weights. This one is just to the left of the grid point, so it will assign almost everything to this uh, fifth grid point. And so, now this algorithm clearly has to go through every data point and then it has to go to the two closest grid points. So the complexity is O of capital N, the number of data points times two to the power of D. Because in higher dimensions, there will be two to the power of D uh, grid points that are adjacent, which you have to visit and assign weights to. Once you've um, finished this part, you sample your kernel. So you take your kernel, it looks like this, and you also sample it at equidistant points. 
Now you have two sequences or two vectors of samples on equidistant points, and you can use the convolution, uh, discrete convolution, to actually compute your kernel density estimate. Now, this can be done using the fast Fourier transform, and this is called the convolution theorem, and runs in n log n time, where n, uh, uh, small n, is the number of grid points. So the total running time of this algorithm is, is given by capital N times two to the power of D plus uh, N log N. And it's very fast for many data points. Let's look at two dimensional linear binning. This red data point assigns weight where the dark blue uh, means more weight. We'll add more data points and see that the grid kind of just lights up where we add data. And in the end, you end up with this beautiful grid, uh, equidistant grid, and then you can compute a 2D convolution. You sample the kernel in two dimensions, and then you convolve these two matrices. And it's really fast, and it works in higher dimensions. But the speed up is it's best in low dimensions, obviously, because it's 2 to the power of d in the algorithm complexity. Okay, I'd like to take one minute to talk about uh, my software implementation. Uh, I've written a library in Python called KDE Py, which is a very, it's not a very inspired name, it's just a quick name, but it's, it's pretty fast and it's starting to become pretty good. So if you'd like to experiment with it, every graph and everything that I've done in this presentation is made using this library. It's on GitHub. so please uh, have a look if you're interested in, in working with kernel density estimation in Python. If you'd like to read more about kernel density estimation, you can uh, look at the book by Silverman. And there's another book by Wand, which is perhaps slightly more difficult to read, a bit more recent. And Drake Vandalplas has a blog post where he talks about kernel density estimation in Python. It's five years old, but it's really good. So uh, I so suggest you take a look at that if you want to. There are a few more references. If you go to KDE Pi uh, and you go to the documentation, there's a literature overview where you can find more information about kernel density estimation. So thanks a lot for uh, watching this and I hope you learned something and uh, hope you have fun playing around with this.